Well, hello and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. As the last US forces left Kabul airport, a unit of Taliban fighters entered accompanied by an unlikely embed. Nabi Boulos, an American Jordanian journalist and the Middle East bureau chief for the Los Angeles Times. Nabi filmed the insurgents clad in US fatigues and carrying American made assault rifles as they surveyed the abandoned material left behind at the airport. The images have now become one of the defining moments of the US withdrawal. Nabi joined us to give us the overview, an overview of the final, the fall of Kabul and the wider view of his patch that stretches from Kabul to Beirut. Hello and welcome Nabi. How are you? Thanks for having me. Great, great to have you with us. Um, some of you watching may remember Nabi from our tour of Jordan, which was great fun. Uh, I remember Nabi playing uh, the violin for Pete the Cheese's birthday. Um, that's an aside really to say also that Nabi is actually a, a, a concert standard violinist. Um, and that's something we're going to come to and talk about a, a bit later in the program. Mm -hmm. um, just, just to start with, um, how, how did you get to, how, how long were you in Kabul before um, it fell? How, were you there in the weeks running up to it? What was, where were you at that time? Well, actually what happened was, it was my photographer who was there, he was there, I believe, on the 13th. So Kabul fell on August 15th. He was there two days earlier. And I was actually set to go uh, on the 15th. In fact, I had, uh, you know, so I had to get a visa. And I had actually planned this with military precision. I mean, I went to Beirut. Uh, I mean, I was in Beirut. I left early morning to go to Dubai, where you can get a visa the same day. And, uh, you know, I landed in time, went to the consulate, paid my money, got my visa. And I thought, you know, I'm all set to travel that night uh, to Kabul. And then a few hours later, I get uh, even the message that my plane was canceled, that my flight was canceled. And this happened with a few other flights. You know, I, 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 I mean, I frankly went and booked a whole bunch of other flights, but there was no luck. Oh, so th this is while everybody else is getting out of Kabul. You're obviously trying yeah. to get in, like most journalists. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, my photojournalist colleague, uh, you know, Marcus Yang, he was there, luckily, so he was able to give us some information and, and, and reporting. We did that beautifully, of course. But I wanted to go there, obviously, as much as as as, well as I could. And eventually, I mean, after many many stops and starts, we managed to get in about maybe six days later, seven days later. And I went in with a Qatari flight. The Qatari Air Force was flying in evacuation flights at that point. We went on hmm. other C-17s. And um, yeah, that day we went out from the airport and I stayed from September 22nd, I think, until around, uh, sorry, from August 22nd until about September 13th. So roughly three weeks. Yeah, okay. Um, t tell us, I mean, you, you've, you, have you spent time in Afghanistan beforehand? Before that? Before that yeah, time? I had a chance to go before. Um, I actually managed to go a few months before the government fell. I went there in May. Yeah. And, this, and, and for me, it was interesting because at the time, I had written a whole bunch of stories, um, well, basically anticipating the Taliban's entry into Kabul. And I must say, to a man, no one, I mean, to a man and to a woman, I should say, as well, I, um, I mean, there was no one predicting the, the imminent fall. I mean, I would go in asking the question, you know, if we're going to have a Saigon moment. And everyone would say, no, 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 we're not. Uh, just look at what happened in the previous time that, that this great ally or, or this great protector left in the mm. Soviet Union. And they said that the Soviet Union uh, you know, created government uh, state for three years after. And they expected the Kabul government to last maybe not three years, but certainly you know, a bit more than it did. And, and in truth, I mean, I mean, the structural issues were obvious even back then. And I think I was right to ask the Saigon question and in fact, in that respect, I wish I had pushed a bit more because it was pretty evident to me that the, that the vanguard of the Afghan national forces were just not supplied well and couldn't really do much without help from the coalition at that point, I have to say. That before you, before but, yeah. that moment at the airport, I mean, in a second, we're going to play a bit of that, that now famous video. Before that, had you had, did you have time to spend with, um, with government forces? But, um, did you see them in action at all? Were you, were you mainly in Kabul? Well, not in August for sure, but, but I mean, I mean, I mean, May. Yes, we did. In May, we had gone out to see the special forces in action, um, and I had flown out actually to Kandahar Air Base, and we had spent time. We had embedded actually with the helicopter crew, and saw them uh, flying out of both Kandahar and out of Kabul. I mean, I mean, we went with them on one of these uh, resupply missions. But that's how I sort of already knew that we're talking about a really difficult situation. Um, I mean, I mean, it's worth noting that that basically the plan was that at some point the government would sort of cut its losses and focus on more strategic areas. Right, and they had about eight thousand checkpoints and outposts that needed to be resupplied. I mean, they needed to be resupplied. 
And the problem was because the Taliban had control of the roads, it was all done by helicopter or by air, mm. which simply was not sustainable. I mean, when we went there in May, we went you know, to this London base, uh, not so far from Kandahar, basically. And we're going with this helicopter in which they've loaded, and this is true, eggs, water, a sheep. It was Eid, so they had got uh, you know, a sheep to slaughter, right? And we just basically fly really, really high up at like 10,000 feet until we're basically above the base. And then the pilot just does, you know, a nice like dive bomb almost, you know, with the helicopter, screeches to a halt right at the base itself, lands with a bump. Everything is thrown out the sides as quickly as possible. And then we go back up again like a jackknife. And the thing was, even with that maneuver, which was very fast, and I must say it was, it was very brave the pilot to do, even with that, we still sustained Taliban fire, which is an indication of how close they are to the base. And so all this is to say that basically there was no way they could sustain that level of operation, right? That level of, of, of area to protect. It seemed like a matter of time. And I must say, in, in August, it was proven right. Uh, and Taliban yeah. was toying with the government until it was time. We, we've done several discussions um, about the various aspects of, um, you know, the American presence in Afghanistan. And one of the particular things we did look at was the way the Afghan forces were supplied and how they're developed. And then we also look, talked about regional development as well. So we spent spent some time doing that. Um, j- just as a, a note, you, you're you um, a joint uh, US-Jordanian citizen. You speak you know, English right. and Arabic, obviously, you know, like um, completely fluently. Has, did Arabic, has Arabic given you a, an edge? It's a very different language to Farsi, but have you found- Absolutely. You able- it, was, it, was actually, it was actually really funny, I have to say, because I mean, I mean we tend to, so I like in our way of working really as a journalistic ISIS, which is to say we go with very, very small teams. Usually it's either just me or me and my photojournalist colleague, Marcus. And and we try, and I usually don't have a fixer. I I, I mean, if I get someone, I get a translator uh, because because I, I, you know, I used to be a fixer myself and I know how easily uh, you could influence the story. And so I try to do my own research as much as possible and get only a, 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 a translator if needed. In the case of the of, of, of this particular assignment, actually, it was it was interesting because most of the translators and most of the journalists who had worked before with us had left. And so there was also the added situation that if you hired someone, what would happen to them, right? If you hired a translator, what would happen to them later on? Or if you hired someone who was a journalist, how would they fare once you left? And so, you know, I was very careful about that, I have to say. And I did eventually use a translator every now and then, but but I but I made sure he wasn't a journalist and I made sure that it was you know separate. Uh, but but just circle back to what you were asking. Yes, the fact is Arabic was tremendously helpful. I mean, I mean, a large number of Taliban speak modern standard Arabic, Pusha, really, Pusha, which is yeah. kind of like speaking Shakespearean almost, you know. And it was very strange. I would walk into these gatherings and be like, "How are you, my brother?" And he would say, "You know, I'm well, my brother." And we would just talk like this, you know, awkwardly for a bit. But it was tremendously useful because they had studied Quran, of course, and all these other things in their youth. And so basically, I could communicate with a fair amount of them. And also, more importantly, uh, they liked Arabic; they respected it. Yeah, uh, you know, it's the language of the religion. So it, it really so, gave uh, you an acceptance that, um, you know, uh, a, a white non-Arabic speaking or non-Farsi speaking person as well. Yeah, I guess. it certainly helped. It certainly helped. I'll say that much. Actually, yeah. For sure. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so to bring us up to just um, let, let, let's just play this um, this bit of footage. We can bring it while um, Isabel's teeing it up here. Um, yeah, let's play. Yeah, here we go. Careful, there's a stretcher. Wow. Oh. All right. We're here right now with the Taliban as they enter into the, what was only minutes ago, uh, it was an American controlled portion of the military airport. Now they're taking over. And there, those, yeah. there, there was more than that. But those images went went around the world, and that really was, you yeah. know, one of one of the, um, the the defining moments of that of of the fall of of Kabul. Um, uh, do, do, how, how did you, were you you're at the gates? Were you already with this group of um, of, of soldiers? What was the situation there? Well, so what happened was basically in the days before that moment, uh, that group of Taliban had already taken over a portion of perimeter security. And it just so happened that we had, uh, you know, I tried to go ahead of time and talk to some of them before. And, and I had struck up a bit of a, uh, you know, like, I mean, I guess some rapport with the commander of this unit. And this unit is called the Hafiz Wa. 
it's a particular unit within the Taliban. It's kind of like special forces they have there. I mean, they have two special forces, or I should say three special forces units, uh, the Belgian 313, the, uh, the Hafez Waq, and, and the Red Unit. This was one of them. And basically, I had a chance to talk to the guy before. And so we had planned to actually be there for the last American C-130 flying out, right? That was our plan. Our plan was basically for Marcus to catch the last American plane flying out of Kabul airport in this iconic moment, right? And I would write the story, you know, around that. Um, and honestly, I mean, I mean, I mean, the situation was this, you know, so in August, I mean, the idea was that the Americans would leave on August 31st, right? I mean, they had said repeatedly, we won't leave before August 31st. And I was convinced that they would at least stick to the letter of that, if not the spirit. So I assumed that they might leave as early as one minute past midnight or as late as one minute before midnight on, on 1st of September, right? As it stands, they left uh, at, at 11.59, you know, like, like right before midnight uh, on, on August 31st. So they left a little bit early, in fact. And so we had gone to the airport trying to catch them. And by the time we got there, the last plane had flown off. And in fact, I remember the Taliban guy saying, khalas, khalas, no more American planes. And then he just says, come with us. And <laughs> we're like, okay, we'll come with you. And we just walk in and the guys, you know, I mean, I mean, they, they basically go, right? They, you know, they ram open this gate and they just walk into what had been really like almost before just this American base. And of course, I mean, there were still these, you know, big MRAPs, these mine resistant uh, armored protection vehicles just sitting there, you know, conquered down. Um, you know, so, so, I mean, it was really, really interesting. And I'm just seeing them sort of, you know, go into these hangars and see these old sky nights from the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. And, and basically seeing all the accoutrements of what had been, you know, for the last 20 years, life in Kabul under the American, uh, uh, you know, that government. It was actually kind of fascinating as a moment. Yeah, it's b b b bizarre in a way. The, um, very much so. Yeah, very bizarre. Um, I, mean, how, I mean, the most bizarre part of it was, sorry to you, but the most bizarre part of it was that they were basically wearing full American uh, supplied gear. So, so basically, you know, like the uniforms uh, were basically American supplied. They had these M4 carbines and M16 carbines with laser sights, all supplied by the Americans. Some of them even had night vision goggles. And these were, you know, quite serious night vision goggles, actually. You know, the type that have, uh, you know, two lenses and then go into one scope. Um, and, and they sort of, you know, flip down from the helmet. All this stuff was there. It was all very, very much like a, like a bad special forces video. Um, and the other thing is yeah. that they accepted you. I mean, you're, and um, we've seen this um, with other reporters too. Um, you're from the Los Angeles Times. They know who you work for, I presume. For sure, for sure. I mean, I mean we had a paper stating who we were. There was no way around that. Uh, they, I mean, they had actually given us permission. And it's worth noting that the Taliban, at least, uh, you know, at that point, were very eager to actually present themselves to the media. And it's interesting how that changed. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think now they're a bit warier. But at the time, for sure, they were really, really quite open. Uh, and in fact, they were excited to have people there. I mean, I mean, they wanted us to film them and to capture what they were doing, right? I mean, I mean, they were interested in that. And you know, it's worth noting, of course, that 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 uh, the margin of risk for someone like me, you know, obviously, A and B, uh, uh, you know, Western journalist with American passport, is significantly different than that of a local Afghan journalist, of course. I mean, and for them, it would have been much harder, I think, in many ways, or perhaps much more dangerous. Uh, in my case. Yeah, we were lucky, I have to say, and and they liked us. We had built a really, you know, you know, like a rapport with that particular unit. Uh, uh, we had filmed them before, and I think they were interested in having us see what they were doing. And after that, presumably, um, they were, you know, very happy about it. Well, I mean, of course, you know, they were happy in the sense that they had the airport. Uh, this was a big victory. You know, they were praying, etc. And I mean. You know, regardless of what anyone thinks, it is it is worth noting that this basically band of guerrilla fighters had managed to defeat, you know, arguably the strongest U.S. military force in the world. So, I mean, I mean, there is some room for them to celebrate. To be clear. Uh, with that being said, I mean, I mean, a lot of the equipment was trashed, of course. It would take a lot of effort to sort of bring back all that stuff. So much money and so much effort was lost and, and gone to waste. And we still have to see what's going to happen with the country, of course. So, yeah, okay. perhaps it was a premature victory, but still a victory. We've got so much to talk about, Nabi, and I wanted to stay with Afghanistan and talk about what's going on there at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, people, if, if people are listening in, please do put your, your questions in the Q&A box. We're going to be talking more about Afghanistan, then we're going to talk about Lebanon, Lebanon, and then we're going to talk about Iraq as well. So this is a wide-ranging conversation. So if you've got questions about Afghanistan, please get them in now, because we'll be moving on soon. Um, Nabi, what's the situation now? I mean, we've read the stories about um, famine, 
uh, you know, shortage of food. I mean, what, what, well, I guess the first question is, what, what does the Afghan government resemble at the moment with the Taliban running it? I mean, what, what institutions are running, how are they run, and maybe you can give us an overview of that. Well, it's worth noting that, but to begin with, the Taliban haven't removed everyone, right? I mean, of course, many, many officials have run away, and of course, the top tier officials have indeed gone and wouldn't have the chance to come back. But most of the technocratic, let's say, uh, you know, bureaucrats who are there, they remain in place. So, for example, uh, the Kabul mayor, or, or the guy who was the Kabul mayor, he's now working as part of the team of the Taliban uh, Kabul mayor, right? Uh, he could have escaped. In fact, he's an American citizen. He chose not to. Um, actually, really quite an honorable man and a good man, I have to say. He stayed and he's working with the Taliban and trying to make sure things continue, uh, uh, just continue working. And I mean, of course, he's the most prominent or perhaps the highest uh, opposition person I've seen do this. But you will see that you know, throughout the chain of command in this mm. that yes, the Taliban have taken over the ministries, but they've kept a lot of the technocratic staff, at least the ones who are willing to come back. But the problem is, and this is a huge problem, is that there's no money. I mean, I mean, this whole thing was basically, um, so the local Afghan currency is called the Afghani. This whole thing was basically, uh, and it was bolstered by, I think, twice monthly shipments of dollars. So these would come in bulk, you know, from America, and these were part of the reserves, right? And they would basically be then distributed among the various banks and the central bank and the Hawala guys. And that way, you know, like when you wanted to do business with the outside world, you would pay your Afghani with the guarantee that this would be sort of backed by dollars at the bank in some way. And, and this is important because the country basically is, is, is fully dependent on imports at this point. Um, and so now the problem is, of course, is that there, is, I mean, there are no dollars, right? Uh, I mean, how am I there were $9.03 billion in reserves that are sitting somewhere in New York, right? There is some other stuff in gold, et cetera, but, but, but you know, cash and things like that, uh, you know, all abroad. And so the problem now is that actually they were supposed to get a shipment of dollars, I believe, on the 12th of August. Right, that was the date for one. And then the State Department said, hey, we're not going to send you the dollars because it seems like things were shaky. The central banker at the time said, no, please do send them. But the shipment never made it. And so, you know, basically, even back in August, there was not much money or okay. much state dollars. Let's just, I think this is really important stuff. But let's just hold, let's just remember all of that and just put that to one side yeah. for a moment because that's that's yeah. about uh, the current the, the, the funding of, 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 the, of the government. And there's yeah. a political response to that, and the part of that is that the the West is uh, not recognising the Afghan government, so it's not getting access to those funds, uh, and so the ministries that would have that money, obviously the money is no longer there. So that that's one thing. But what's happening on the streets? What's happening in regional towns? What's happening in terms of trade and commerce? What's going on in well, just in terms of people it's getting? Awful. It's all paralysed. I mean, that's yeah. the problem. I mean, I mean, I mean. Yes, you're right. You know, you could say that we should tax on Taliban and I won't give the money unless you see some behavioural change. But the fact is that people are suffering, and, and, and this suffering is because of our own making, uh, I mean, our own, it's because of the West's making, right? It's because of Western policymakers making. And so, uh, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, what you're seeing now on the streets is, is basically people being limited to, uh, you know, $200 a week, so that's roughly about 10,000 Afghani, right? And that's not much money in, in Kabul these days, right? And, and the problem is everything is getting more expensive because there's a fear of scarcity, right? And so it's a cycle that builds itself. You're seeing basically a, a lack of confidence in the currency, and this is continuing in, in ways which further the price, where it becomes more expensive to buy goods. So basically what you're seeing now is people waiting in lines in front of the banks for hours, if not even days. Like they come, you know, during one day and continue their place in the line the next day, right? You often have a situation where basically people are now like, like having to sell their goods, right? They sell their, uh, you know, their household possessions to be able to get some mm -hmm. money. Uh, it's 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 really quite dire. And it's so you're being for, they're being like forced out of a wage-based economy into a barter economy. Well, basically, yeah, that's essentially what's happening in, in, in some parts, for sure. Yeah, okay, okay. You, you've you got some stories, I mean, you've got a slightly, a slightly different story, and this relates to partly, I think, the interest is, because you are you are a professional musician, or you were before yeah. this job took over your life. Um, yeah. tell, tell us a bit about that. It's the, the, the orchestra that you've been following. Yeah, so, so, um, so this is part of the Afghanistan National Institute for Music, and this is a project uh, that's, that's, that's been actually quite successful. It started in 2010, and since then they formed this all-female orchestra called Zuhra, and they have been playing all over the world. And uh, I mean, really, this has all been sort of this, this, uh, this just gargantuan effort on the part of the director of the school to get all these people out, right? So we, so we wanted to get basically uh, students, faculty, 
and some of their relatives out of the country so they could restart their, their, their music education. Because of course, it's not really possible to do music now under the Taliban, or at least in that school anymore. And so what's been happening is this guy has just been trying his best. I mean, I mean, it's, it's been like just, just, just a series of, of stop start situations where he tries to get them out. He, he gets a portion out, but then you know, others were stuck or they come very, very close to a checkpoint and then they're sent back. It was really a very, very suspenseful time. And, uh, and basically now, in fact, in fact, now it's, it's, it's 11.20, I think. Actually, now it's 10.20 in Doha. Now the last group of people he tried to airlift are out. They've landed in Doha and are now at the compound. So actually, you know, like I'll be writing the story in the coming day, uh, you know, about this journey. And so now these people will now be heading off to Lisbon, actually. You know, they've found a home uh, you know, in Lisbon where they're going to be uh, just, just making this institute again. Uh, you know, so like reconstituting it there. And of course, they're happy and they're sad. I mean, they're happy because they mm. managed to save all these people, but sad because it means they've lost their home. Yeah. Basically. And that and that's it, really, isn't it? For it, for every one of those people who's escaping, it's a, uh, you know some relief for them, yeah. you know, their own their own welfare, but you know, the tragedy for for them, their families, and also the nation. It's just that I mean, I mean, the fact is that when you leave your 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 home country, you know, you are indeed just a number. You know, as I heard one person say, one Afghan person say. You know, like you're just one more refugee. And for a lot of people, uh, you know, the magic of their work was that they were in Afghanistan, and they're getting yeah. Afghanistan, where it's very hard to do. Now but Nabi, this this really this raises a very important question, and and this comes back to what we were talking about in terms of the the, the figures. There is that um, nine billion dollars Afghan reserves. Um, there's the amount of money that you know the World Food Program. I gather that there are international agencies working in in Afghanistan. And the Taliban yeah. is allowing them to work, but that that sure. has to. There's a responsibility of the West. I mean, we have, you know, the United States in principle has abandoned them. Um, uh, yet it has the ability to alleviate the situation at the moment. But what's it doing? Well, it's not <laughs> simply. It's just not alleviating it. I mean. Uh, well, so I've seen arguments that say, you know, so what's the purpose of giving the money up now? Uh, you, know, you know, all this will do is basically just uh, just add a little bit of relief now, but, but the systemic issues remain. And and that's a correct argument. The systemic, the, the systemic situation will remain, right? I mean, without, um, you know, a constant source of dollars, which has usually been A, then things will probably not work out in the long run. But mm. for now, it's winter time. People need to live. And the fact is that this situation is a the U.S. is making. Right now, we can argue, uh, you know, you know, if it was Trump's or Bush or whoever, we can talk about who's at fault, whether it's Biden, et cetera. Uh, you know, the fact remains, it is the U.S. is making, and it needs some kind of solution, even a temporary one. And that does involve unfreezing the assets. Yeah, no, absolutely. Let, let's bring in one question now um, from, we've got Sheila de Belague. If you Please, if you've got more questions on Afghanistan, do get them in now, because we're going to, next thing is we're going to talk about Lebanon. But Sheila de Belague, go ahead, Sheila. Um, yes, I, I'm just going back a bit. Um, I'm intrigued to know, I mean, this, everyone else may know the answer to this, who funded the Taliban during their time in the wilderness? And then who funded the military campaign that led to their victory? Well, so of course, the, the, I mean, the standard answer to this is to say that, that they got funding from Pakistan, and, and back in the day, they had funding from Afghanistan. You know, from Gulf donors or from, or from, let's say, more extreme, let's say, uh, you know, Islamic figures. But that's not the whole story. And in fact, I would say it's a very small one, uh, because the fact is that at some point in time, the Taliban, you know, became self-sustaining because they controlled most of the highways. And so they could tax everything, right? I mean, they could basically, uh, I mean, they had checkpoints everywhere and they were able to tax shipping as it was going through. It's worth noting that Afghanistan is a conduit country, right? And so there's a lot of stuff that's basically going on between obviously Iran and Pakistan and, and et cetera, you know, and, and, and obviously Uzbekistan and, and all the various countries that are surrounding that area. And so essentially what ended up happening was, uh, I mean, you know, as the Taliban gained more roads, as they gained more highways, they were, and they were just able to tax everything. And that's not just drugs, by the way. There's also this, this misconception that most of the Taliban profits uh, come from opium, right? You know, that basically it's like a narco state in the matrix. That's not really true. The fact is that, that and there's been a lot of research on this, and, and the good research will show you that basically it's, it's everything. I mean, they tax uh, you know, cars, fuel, uh, foodstuffs, wheat, everything, right? You know, and drugs, right? And so basically, uh, they've managed to create revenue that way. In fact, one researcher estimated that in Zaranj, which is this border province, uh, I think not far from Iran, um, I believe 
the estimates were that the Taliban were getting, I think, about $200 million in tax, right, because of so much money coming in. Mm. So that's obviously, I mean, I mean, that obviously dwarfs whatever you would get from the government at that point. Yeah. I mean, government assistance, I think, was around $20 million. This is 10 times that. So I, there is money to be had. I guess this is this is the open question, isn't it? So that that funded the insurgency. So that's sort of t- Taliban PLC or however you want to t- to categorize it. But now they are the state, and those taxes do those taxes continue to fund them personally? Um, the question is, how do you govern? Um, and and like and that, that is an open government. question. Hmm? I mean, I mean, it's worth noting the Taliban have governed. You know, so yeah. So not just in disastrously one, though, yeah. arguably disastrously. No, no, of course. I mean, I mean, I'm not talking about the five-year situation yeah. back in 2001, right? That was different, of course, and they presided over basically a gutted state, right? Now they've taken over wholesale of a functional state that is very different, that is linked to the outside world in ways that that one could never dream of. So that is different, right? But it is worth noting, for example, right, the Taliban, when they controlled the highways, uh, you know, so I had the chance to go to Kandahar and talk to a bunch of truck leaders, right? I went to the outskirts of the town, of the city, I should say, and I met with some of these truckers who were waiting to go through. And when I talked to them, who do they prefer? Because I mean, I, I mean, these guys had driven from Herat and were now on the way to Kabul. So they had gone the breadth of the country and had passed through dozens of Taliban checkpoints. And they surprised me. They actually said that they prefer to go through Taliban checkpoints than government areas. And I asked why. And they said, because the Taliban at least taxed them once. They actually gave them a ticket. And this guy showed me a, you know, a customs receipt, a pink customs receipt with all the information and how much he had paid. And he said, with this receipt, I can go from the rock all the way in the West and go all the way to Kabul, right? And I will pass through every Taliban checkpoint without any trouble. But when I go through any government checkpoint, right, even if I pay, I will get shaken down, they want bribes, and they'll even attack us. And he showed me a video of this trucker who had been shot up in the foot by some soldier at a customs checkpoint. And this was on a WhatsApp group between different truckers talking about, you know, the various dangers on the road. And so my point is, is that Really, the Taliban had shown some proficiency in governing, which was in many ways more disciplined and, frankly, better than the government. It's awful to say, but it is true. Hmm. Okay, we're going we're to move on. Hillary Matthews, I'm going to bank your question for later because we've got to, we have to move on to, to Lebanon now. So just bear with us, Hillary, and we'll come back to it in a second. Yeah. We're going to move to Lebanon. Nabi, you've got an enormous area. I mean, I, I could ask you... I mean, how do you manage to cover it and, and keep tabs and everything? And how do you decide to do which story? Because it's, a, it's a, an absolutely mammoth area. But we're, gonna, we're going to switch to, to um, Lebanon. Uh, as people who watch us regularly will know that we have covered events in Lebanon quite a bit, from the huge explosion at the port to the financial crisis, the currency collapse. Um, so we're going to delve a bit into that. But first of all, Nabi, just tell us, you, you were there, weren't you, when that bomb went off? Not the bomb, so the explosion, the explosion, sorry. Well... Well, so in fact, what happened was, you know, my old apartment, uh, so I'm in another apartment now. The, the old apartment I was in, it had a balcony basically right in front of the silos, um, you know, overlooking the silos, uh, which, which, was, which was near where the fire had happened. And in fact, I tweeted a picture. And if you look at some of these like forensic videos, they tend to quote my tweet as the first indication that something was happening, um, you know, on social media. Because basically, I, I just walked outside and it was, I think, 554 or maybe a bit before that. And I just took a picture. And I said, you know, there's a big fire in Beirut port. And I'll be honest with you, because we're the Los Angeles sign and we don't to cover everything, uh, you know, I thought this was going to be, you know, nothing important. I mean, it's a fire at the, you know, at the port. This is hardly, uh, you know, front page news for the, for the West Coast readers of the LA Times. But then at some point in time, a few minutes later, I was just sitting and, and, and you heard this roaring, this, you know, sound. And I just ran outside expecting to see airplanes. In fact, I remember, I, you know, I just ran out and looked up and I saw that all my neighbors were doing the same. Uh, we had thought it was this jet strike, basically. And then I ran back to the other balcony to look at the sky, and I saw that the fire had actually grown, and it was getting bigger. And I thought, maybe this might be the fire, actually. And that's when I went, and I grabbed my motorcycle to go to the site of the blast. Uh, I mean, I mean, the site of the, you know, the fire at the time. And I honestly don't remember what happened then, because the um, you know, next thing I know, I come to, uh, you know, on the highway right in front of the a port, you know, the closest point you get to the port without actually being inside it. And I was completely disoriented. I was just concussed. I had no idea why I was there. Um, I couldn't find my phone. Um, I mean, I actually still have no memory of the last six minutes before the blast. Um, I basically came to, you know, and, and I guess, I mean, I mean, well, you know, from what I can gather, because my phone, I think, was recording at, at, at the moment when the blast happened. 
it seems I must have arrived at that point. And just as I pressed record on my phone, the blast happened. And I guess I must have been wearing my motorcycle helmet because of the smoke or something. Because, you know, I looked at my helmet later on and the visor was gone. The top visor was gone. And there were these two gashes where I think I must have landed on the ground. And so you know, basically without it, I'd be dead. Um, you know, and a few hours after I came to, I sort of managed to find my other phone and somehow managed to contact my then fiance who came and basically swept me off the floor. She too had been unhurt, well, relatively. And we went to the hospital and I got a, uh, you know, like a scan of the brain and I was fine. You know, luckily just a, you know, very, very strong concussion. But yeah, to this day, I don't remember what happened six minutes before the blast. I I, I, you I, did your editors ring up, you ring you up there and then say, where's your copy? No, not at all. I actually rang them up. Um, I mean, I'm told that I rang them up, it seems. You know, I tried to send something. Somehow when I was being driven to the hospital, I, and this is, you know, I mean, I have no memory of this, so, so it's all strange. I, I just like was typing something on my phone and everyone was screaming at me to stop. And then I managed to call my editor and tell them, hey, I'm, I'm alive, but I don't know what's going on, etc." So, you know, I mean, it was, you know, I was very lucky. There's just no yeah. ways about it. I was exceedingly lucky. Yeah, that that explosion is seen as the you know yet the the latest. It's possibly one of the worst symptoms in the malaise of Lebanese politics. Uh, there's an investigation now going on into the cause of the explosion and corruption and how the port is managed is at the heart of it. Um, tell us what's happening there with that investigation. But then I also want to talk about what's going on at the moment because there is a dreadful economic crisis in Lebanon. And the late, most one of my recent things is that that uh, the Gulf not only uh, not being friendly towards um, uh, uh, Lebanon, but in actual fact they're imposing sanctions, particularly Saudi Arabia, and it just seems an appalling series of events. But let's just go go back. Us well, you, you choose. To, where do we start? Where do we sure, start? I'll start with the investigation. Uh, there is no investigation. It's it's not going on. You know, basically, the investigating judge has actually been calling different people. But he's been thwarted at every turn, basically, by parliamentarians and lawmakers whose intent, it seems, is to not allow the investigation to go through. And they use different sort of, uh, you know, excuses to basically justify why they're trying to suspend that judge, except that they say he's biased. They had already moved the previous one saying he was biased because his house sustained some damage. This one they're trying to remove because they say he's basically targeting unfairly some groups, etc. Uh, it's, it's all very, very dirty politics right now. And... You know, it's funny because some people will basically blame one party or the other. Essentially, every party in power now is complicit in this cover-up. And the reason why this is so, uh, you know, anyway, I believe, is because essentially, you know, the real problem behind all this is that there's neglect. I mean, we can talk a lot about sort of the conspiracy behind all this stuff, and, and people will see conspiracies everywhere they want to. But the fact is, you're talking about a bureaucratic system that allowed you know, for seven years, this stuff to be stockpiled at the port. So no matter what sort of conspiracy you have, there is obviously gross negligence. And the fact is it's not being investigated, at least not well. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this has only been one part of basically a Job-esque list of problems. And right? obviously the currency is down by 90%. Uh, in fact, I mean, I used to work in the orchestra in Lebanon. I was what you would call a public servant in this case. And so, you know, I was paid about 3 million Lebanese lira a month, which at the time was roughly $2,000. You know, so what, plus, what was that job I didn't hear? I mean, sorry, I didn't hear what you what you were doing. So I was playing in the orchestra in Lebanon way back okay, in the yeah, day. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You know, I was paid about 2000 well, no, a bit more, like 2500 let's say. Anyway, and so and so now that same amount of money would, would give me $150, maybe, you know? So that's a huge, huge difference is my point, right? And so, uh, you know, this extends to everything. Gas is this now, right? The prices have become essentially astronomical. Yes, we're not, you know, you know, hyperinflation. It's not changing so dramatically by the day, but it is getting there, right? And there is no solution in sight, at least not one that seems logical, right? That's one of the big issues now. Sorry, go ahead. I, I just, I'm just trying to stand back and trying to get um, perspective on this. We know, you know, Lebanon has gone through, I mean, particularly in relations with Israel, um, you know, frequently Israel has either bombed or taken over parts of Lebanon. We're not seeing that at the moment. This is... Uh, an, an implosion and the, the political system has been there for a very long time and it's entrenched but this really is incredibly unstable isn't it in, in terms of um you know, if you go back you know 20 years it's particularly bad 
Look, I mean, the political system is, I mean, I mean, I mean, the fact is, is that this was basically a very designed political system, right, in Lebanon. Uh, you know, essentially, it's actually a very robust system in ways because, you know, even though not one group is more powerful than the other one at this point, or let's say like, you know, that, that not one single group can dominate all the rest, the fact is that it's very hard to bring all of them down. You see what I mean? Like, the, like there's like a matrix of, of, of different factions here. And essentially it's a rock, paper, scissors situation where, yeah. where none can defeat the other you know, on their own. And so basically, you know, they're very adept at protecting themselves and they've done a great job. And so, you know, in that sense, they've done very well. The problem is, is that you know, there's no money coming in and there's a lot of, uh, I would say, impatience on the part of the African community because uh, they just don't want to support this matrix anymore. Uh, Saudi Arabia perhaps has taken a harsher line because of what was said by, uh, by, you know, by this minister. Right? He said something about the Yemen war. And for this, and, and for Saudi, this was basically the straw that broke the camel's back effectively, right? They just said, you know, we've had enough. Um, you know, we see no point in speaking to Lebanon at this point. And it's worth noting that their main man on the ground, you know, Saudi Khairi, hasn't been a force in Lebanese politics now for quite some time. So, you know, I mean, I question the calculation, I have to say, but still I can understand it. Yeah, ju just to repeat, um, just just tell us, re repeat what Saudi has has done to Lebanon. Also, based on what? I mean, it's, it, it seems to me that the... Um, for, for those that don't know, there's a well-known um, Lebanese media figure who's now the um, information minister. Um, he was the yeah, presenter was of who, who wants, wants to be a millionaire, millionaire wasn't he? Hmm? Yeah, he was those who wants to be a millionaire, like the Arab version of it. And he showed up on some on some show, I think, you know, a month before he became minister, where he was asked about the Yemen war. And the word he used was that it was pointless, abathia. And I mean, you know, that has been said by quite a few people, right? But the fact that it came from a Lebanese minister at this point and that he expressed, let's say, support for the Houthis, uh, who, are, who are the enemies of the Saudis in this war. Um, I mean, maybe not support, but he said basically that, that he, they understood why they were fighting. Uh, this caused a huge, huge problem for the Saudis. And again, it was just the last straw. I mean, I mean, in, you know, in interviews with various people, they've said that, that this wasn't the reason why, but it was just, you know, one more in a litany of reasons why. Yeah, I mean, behind that, obviously, is the, the um, Saudi-Iranian rivalry um, and, and uh, um, Hezbollah's um, role. How is, how is Hezbollah handling it? I mean, the... You know, they're they're the, they're well funded. They've got um, you know great backing, but politically they're in a very tricky position. They are. I mean, the fact is that, that Hezbollah now has framed itself, you know, perhaps inadvertently, as the protector of this matrix of different groups. Right? It's, it's basically now the protector of the system, which is something that you know is strange for Hezbollah to be because in theory, you know, it stands outside the system and has always sort of portrayed itself like that. I mean, I mean, it's fair to say that in terms of uh, Sort of the corruptibility or or the corruption that sort of you know suffuses the political class. Right? Hezbollah in the past was seen perhaps as a bit you know better than most. That's gone now because it really is the main protector of the political class, and it's very very tricky. I mean, its own audience uh, you know comprises people who are also very very poor. Yeah. And so let, let, I mean, let's just know, let's just problem. step back for a second for for those people who don't know. Mm -hmm. the Lebanon's Lebanon's constitution is basically uh, a, a sectarian based constitution. The power sharing, thing. Power yeah, sharing, power yeah, sharing yeah, which which it's allocates um, eighteen different sects. Yeah, you know, and so basically, I mean, I mean, I mean, very simply, uh, the top positions, right? The top one is, is for a Maronite Christian, uh, um, you know, then the prime minister is for a Sunni Muslim, and the speaker of the house is for a Shiite, right? Uh, but at the same time, then you have, of course, a whole bunch of force trading that happens for every cabinet position. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, in the conservatory, right? It's a state institution, right? So the director of the conser of the music conservatory, right? Where in theory, this should be someone who, let's say, is very learned in the ways of, of music pedagogy or, or has some knowledge as a performer, et cetera. And to be fair, they tried to find someone like that, but they have to be from a certain sect. They have to be actually Roman Orthodox Christian. And, and if they weren't, they were disqualified. Isn't that kind of funny? So basically, even something as 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 let's say pointless as as a director of a state yeah. conservatory. So th this is they're, they're this is the irony involved. in the way that Hezbollah it was this you know outside group, a guerrilla force that basically has yeah. evolved from the, uh, the from the from the civil war involves it's evolved from that. Um, this you know backed by Iran. Coming and then actually gets involved in what you would call constitutional politics and gets involved in the negotiations. Well, I mean, it's had a party for a while. Yeah. Right. I mean, the party has been, it's, it's, had, a, it's had this political win for, for quite some time now. 
But the fact that it emerged now as the main sort of detector, yeah, right, of the system, that's really just just been yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's so I think it's the shock for many people. So in a way, its own strength has become has undermined its it's, it's um, undermined itself in 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 doing this. Um, yeah. I've got I've got a question here from um, Hooky Walker. That's uh, Harold Walker, who says, is Nabi related to a thief Bulos? Wow, a thief Bulos. So the one from Lebanon, yes, I am indeed. He is my great uncle. Um, I, I believe you're talking about Atif Alvarez Bulos, who, who is a, or was, I should say, he was an opera singer, but also a linguist. Uh, and he was working at the AUB, and I think he, uh, he had something called the Orpheus Ensemble, or the Orpheus Choir, I believe. Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, he was tragically killed, uh, um, actually right before the Civil War began in Lebanon. He apparently was murdered. It was very, very kind of uh, like hush-hush. But yes, you know, I am related to him. Indeed. Okay, okay. Go, uh, Hookie, we've got, got to get you in for a, a small um, follow-up um, question in a second. Hookie um, spent a lot of time in, in, uh, in Lebanon and also Iraq, which is where we're going to turn to next. Um, Nabi, that we, we're going to talk about elections in Iraq um, and the huge protests that are coming up to that, but I also want to talk about climate change. Um, and just, just I want to start with that first of all, if possible. Um, for those, if you haven't been to Iraq, Iraq is any anyhow a an incredibly hot country. If you go down to you know, Basra, if you go down to the Shat al Arab, it's the hottest place I, one of the hottest places I've ever been. Um, and obviously, over the years, it was um, Saddam Hussein drained the marshes there. But then, since then, Turkey has built its dams on the Euphrates, um, and and that that has um, has has uh, prevented the you know, water from coming down. Um, but in addition to that. Things have got worse and worse. Tell us what's what's how the Iraqis have been uh, affected by this. Well, so I mean, of course, you've had the trouble with with obviously aging infrastructure. You know, clearly, still a war within the country. I mean, I mean, it's worth noting that that only a few years ago we had ISIS, and that war destroyed a lot of infrastructure. And so the upshot of all this is is that Iraq's infrastructure is shot. Right? Uh, you know, whether it's electricity, whether it's pipes for water, everything else. Right? This is a country that is just not prepared for climate change in any real way. And the problem is, is that, you know, if things become really problematic, if you actually have this region where there's water flooding, you know, we could lose areas like Basra. I mean, you could lose a quarter of Basra, right? Uh, you know, if, you know, if some of these dams fail, you would see actually parts of Baghdad submerged up to one meter. So this is really a catastrophic situation. And, and that's the case of like too much water, but you also have in other cases, too little water. I mean, in fact, you've already had a situation now in various villages and towns where you actually have fights over water because livestock are, are you know, they're just not able to go to lands where there is, let's say, uh, you know, sweet water, right? It's too brackish, right? There's too much salt yeah. because of the situation there, there's, because, of, because of overuse of the ground aquifers and things like that. And so essentially, this is a country that's not prepared, you know, at all, right? The oil situation, for example, right? They keep on flaring. In fact, uh, you know, I heard today that the flaring of the oil in Iraq, I think, is more than, I think, like the six top other flares combined, right? So it is by far the top one. And that just spews a lot of you know, obviously, I'm mean, pollution to the air, and the problem in general is that, you know, there's no interest on the top level about climate change, and, and more importantly, the solutions would require a real change of mindset among the ruling class in Iraq, and that's just not going to happen. Right? I mean, I mean, this is a country where basically these people have been rapacious in their corruption. Right? They've been, you know, always eager to basically get their cut of the pie without actually, any, you know, actually giving anything back. And the problem is that in Iraq, you, you know, we're seeing this more and more. Like, you know, in the elections, for example, you have people going to the villages and promising to bring them water, you know, or get them a water grid. You know, this is how basic these demands have become, right? And so the problem is that, you know, we're seeing all this along with, you know, what is essentially now really a, a, a very high degree of cynicism in the political class. You know, like the elections this year, I mean, well, you know, for one thing, it's worth noting, we have a stop the steel movement also in Iraq right now. Where you have this group of Shiite militias who are contesting the election results, um, but the bigger issue is is that yes, although there was one group that played the new electoral rules better than the others, you know, the one that's led by Sadr, the the issue is now is that actually overall the voting decreased, right? There wasn't that much voting this year, and that indicates a real fatigue with the new government of Iraq or with Iraq's government of the last twenty you know, years at this point. And so you know, this is happening. I mean, I mean, government stress has never been higher. 
right? And at the same time, this is the moment when government needs to step up and actually do something about climate change, and it's just not going to happen. That's the problem. It, it, it's, a, it's appalling. I mean, um, you can't see the capacity, you can't see politics evolving to a, stand, a, 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 to a point where you get a unitary force or a, a coalition of people who believe in governance. It's just, it, it doesn't work that way. It's about interest groups. Well, it's worth noting that this was basically by design to an extent. I mean, the fact is that when, you know, when the Americans set up these, these, these sectarian-based quotas, right, over these countries, right, and whether it's Lebanon or whether it's Iraq, right, you know, what this does is basically, it turns ministries into thieves, right? And they become basically, you know, just a money-making scheme for the constituency of the minister, right, at the time. And that's the problem. I mean, I mean, there is no interest in having a shared vision for Iraq or Lebanon for that matter. It's all about, you know, I need this ministry so I can give my people a job. It, it, but is, is, is Iraq's constitution um, sectarian-based? Is it, oh, I thought it was one person, one said, vote. Yeah, sure. Also, I mean, I mean, the Speaker of the House, for example, uh, has to be a Sunni, right? The president, the, the prime minister has to be a Shiite, and I believe the president has to be a Kurd. I mean, again, we're talking about a situation where basically, you know, you know, power sharing is key throughout these things, and you have, again, this sectarian quota that must be fulfilled across every cabinet level. That's really the problem, right? I mean, again, the constituents are not, I mean, I mean, I mean, the people who are working in these ministries overall, you know, they're not there to serve the people. They're there to serve their party. So it it provides us a short term solution, but uh, you know it's incredibly corrosive for even you know short. It term provides people. a short term piggyback. You know, yeah. that shuts people off. That's really all it does. Yeah, incredible. Unfortunately. Yeah, we we've got about um, fifteen minutes left. Um, I'd love to get more questions um, now, please, and I'd love to get if if Hooky Walker's um, there, I'd love to to get him to bring to bring in a few more questions. But Nabi, the I, I find this really. Um, it, it's um, depressing. Um, if you look um, uh, in, in the Middle East, north of Saudi Arabia, I mean, Jordan's, we haven't spoken about Jordan, but uh, Jordan's <coughs> not ideal. Um, it's a pretty appalling situation from, you know, you, Syria, Iraq. Um, it, it's, uh, everything <coughs> we've described, Lebanon, has been deeply depressing. And, and it points to further instability. I mean, t- tell me, tell me I'm wrong. The fact is, it's hard to look at the Middle East now and see any sort of room for optimism. I mean, you know, recent re- I mean, recent research has indicated that even when it comes to Corona, right, uh, the region is going to bounce back far slower than other places. Um, you know, we're seeing essentially, uh, well, basically all the issues of climate change that we talk about, whether it's water scarcity, right, rising temperatures, right, making infrastructure unable to handle um, these extreme weather conditions, all this is already happening in the Middle East. Right. So in Jordan, you have the threat of losing, you know, you know, all viable sources of fresh water. This is a disaster, right? And these countries are designed in such a way that they can't sustain their populations anymore. I mean, finally, you know, it's worth noting that in the case of Jordan, it's not just a matter of mismanagement, because of course that's there, right? But you're talking about basic math, right? This is a country, I think, you know, whose water supply was supposed to basically sustain about 2 million people. It has now about 10, right? And those population explosions aren't really the fault of Jordan. Yes, there are fertile people, I can tell you. But at the same time, you know, you've had many, many you know, crises. And Jordan, you know, has a refugee sort of, uh, and it's been, it's been the main destination, right? And so Jordan's a case where you have just so many people for that plot of land, and that's being replicated elsewhere, right? Essentially, the social contract that has provided, you know, subsidies and provided, let's say, plenty, or, or plenty enough for people to shut up and not uh, be resentful against the government, that's gone and that's eroding. And all we're seeing now, really, throughout the region, are people reacting to that because the pie is getting smaller. Yeah. yeah. And and I guess there's no, um, you know, the, the the trend in US engagement in the Middle East has been withdrawal. And you, you know, you can go, you go to, uh, go to um, well before Trump to, to look at that. It's just, um, um, you know, I, mean, you go, I mean, look, I'll have a, I'll have a contrary view on this, right? Yeah. I, I actually genuinely believe that the US sort of, intervention in the region has been corrosive especially in the last 20 years oh yeah yeah um, i mean i mean i mean i'd be hard pressed to sort of see benevolence see the, the benevolence of that and, and and i must say a lot of you know so i'm an american as well but i must say a lot of americans you know often mistake the idea that they came in with good intent as to be a catch-all for all the troubles that they've caused and the fact is that it's not um I mean, I mean, even in, in, in U.S. criminal law, there is the notion of manslaughter, right, where you might not have, not have criminal intent, 
right? But you killed someone, right? Well, the fact is that, that we've been killed by care in this region for far too long. Um, I mean, I, I, get, I guess, I guess, when, I mean, what you're saying is, you, um, I mean, there are, two, there are multiple, we could talk about this at, at some length, and we could talk about US support for Israel and the, the um, supporting authoritarian regimes and how that repressed um, oh. development within the Middle East and uh, pushed people, I suppose, towards religion and uh, you know, Islam, Islamic fundamentalism. I mean, there are various reasons why this happened, right? You can yeah, talk yeah. about the embassy, as you said. Yeah, you can talk about, about that. But Iraq, Iraq is, the, is the watershed moment, isn't it, in terms of the breakdown of the, of the regional order? Let's say one more. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I'd argue that Afghanistan provides a pretty good preview of, of, of what will happen in Iraq. Well, you know, not a preview, because it did happen in Iraq before. In 2015, yeah. uh, I mean, in 2014, sorry. But the fact is, is, is that I'd say that Afghanistan is really instructive as to what happened, right? The fact is that you had a situation where you know, the U.S. tried you know, to come in and do good, right? And when they left, you know, they left a big mess. And now the problem is that there is no way to solve it in any way that would perhaps achieve any of the goals that they had wanted in the beginning. I mean, I mean, you know, it's worth noting that the Taliban are back in power, right? Why we've come full circle, right? Um, and I mean, you have to question why all these lives were lost on both sides, really. And the same thing in Iraq. What's going to happen now? I mean, I mean, Iraq, you know, it's it's going to be twenty years in a little bit. Mm. You know, what has happened since then? I mean, can we count any bit of success? And you know, with that in mind, it's worth noting these interventions have been failures throughout. It's time yeah. to reassess. Okay, let, let's. Um, we've got. Just under 10 minutes, please um, put your questions in the box. If you don't ask your questions, I will wrap up and we won't be able to con continue this. <laughs> um, so, um, Hooky, you're there, so I'm going to pick on you. Thoughts? Yeah. Please. Well, I wasn't going to ask a question, and I, I apologise for asking about Afif Boulos, but he was a great musical figure in my when I first went to Beirut. Um, I was going oh, to ask a question. Let's talk about it later on, actually. I'll... I, I, you know, I'll get your email later on and talk to you about it because I would like to ask you about it in the future. Yeah, well, you, can talk ask... about, you, can, uh, you can talk about it in Arabic and also in Fushar. No, no. uh, I was going uh, to ask, uh, was going to ask about corruption in, uh, in Iraq, but Nabi has covered this exactly. The thing is, there's two kinds of corruption in Iraq. There's the regular corruption where you can't get a license unless you hand somebody some money. But then there is this kind of corruption which is built into the Constitution, where, as yeah. he says, a ministry is a fiefdom. And I'm afraid that the Americans, supported by the British after 2003, built this into the system by um, yeah. the first time they established the, the Coalition Provisional Authority was done on a sectarian basis, largely, exactly. I think, under the influence of, of the Shiite uh, Ahmed Chalabi. So we're to blame. We can't get away from it. So my, I'll, put, I'll put a question. Is this dual corruption the biggest problem facing Iraq, or are there some other problems even bigger? <laughs> Well, even bigger. I mean, let's say the self-made problems. No, this is the biggest, right? Because it it affects everything, right? I mean, I mean, I mean, that sort of corruption infects everything, right? The army back in 2014 was was a shadow of what it is now because corruption would be say hollowed it out. And you can bet in the future we're going to see the army, and despite all the changes that happened since the war on ISIS, we'll see it, you know, also hollowed out, hollowed out by corruption. It's just there's just too much money, right? And and I basically, you know, being honest is not helpful in this stage. We are talking again. Where, where, where you have fiefdoms and people need to make money from that, right? It's, it's basically the system, right? They have to play it. And so Iraq, yeah, I think the biggest sort of self-made problem is corruption. Uh, but again, they're going to be facing a problem of climate change. I mean, Basra is, is an oven, right? Basra should be booming. Basra should be, um, it should be a metropolis, right? You're talking about the richest city in, in Iraq, in theory. But Basra has nothing. It has power cuts. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is an area that I think has, I think, if I'm saying about 70% of Iraq's oil is and they are our country in the world. And yet you have power cuts in Basra and people can't afford to have AC in the summer. That is simply unbelievable. Mm, yeah. Okay, um, um, Diane Cook, a good question here. Go on, Diane, you there? Yeah, Nabi, as you were talking, I'm, I was thinking across the three countries, climate change, which we don't really talk about in this context, because we talk about the detail of corruption and so on. Um, but it's so devastating uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's not going to go away. And I was just wondering what, what people are left with, really, because the governments aren't going to be responding. Um, as an aside, you said that, you know, you've got masses of flaring in Iraq. 
presumably because nobody is wanting to use the natural gas that they're burning off for infrastructure, for generating power and so on. Um, and so my question really, or my thought was that the only thing it seems to me the individual can do is to start to walk. And where do you walk to? N Nabi, in that answer, well, can you talk about some family structures as well? Because that has been tremendously important across the Middle East. You have a big family structure and normally somehow people can help out in some way, but that's broken down. I mean, it's broken down in the sense that there's less money to go around. And, and yeah, I mean, the family ties, you know, the tribe, etc. that you had before, the support network you had before, is less strong than it used to be. This is just the way it is now, you know, with, with the fragmentation of, of, of you know, societies, etc. Uh, but in terms of walking, uh, I mean, I had the chance to actually join people when they left Syria to go all the way to Sweden. You know, I was on the migrant trail at the time. And the fact is, that's where they're walking, right? right? We're still seeing today, right, people trying to go into the EU again somehow, right? Uh, in fact, right now, uh, in the Iraqi Kurds, right, and, and they're all from Kurdistan, right, in the KRG, the semi-autonomous region, and this area is supposed to be safe and secure, and it's supposed to be a model for the rest of Iraq, and yet it actually exemplifies the problems of Iraq. There, despite security, people have no money, they have no jobs, they have nothing, right? And that's because you have an incredibly, incredibly corrupt structure over them it basically closes all avenues for advancement to the regular person. And the only result, I mean, I mean, the only sort of avenue they have is to go abroad. And, and I mean, it's worth noting that, that the climate change situation here is problematic because, I mean, I mean, think of farmers. You know, I'll give you an example, right? In Jordan, right, for example, right, we have farmers that basically will make tomatoes, etc. I mean, I mean, they will grow tomatoes, cucumbers, etc. These are crops that are very, very thirsty, right? And so, in effect, you are, you know, exporting Jordan's already scarce water abroad. And so the government has been trying to sort of, you know, reduce that. But the result is that these farmers are basically unemployed, right? They can't do anything else. Right? There aren't any other jobs. You know, they move towards the cities. You have unrest growing, etc. And this is what's been happening throughout. I mean, in Syria, that was one of the sparks. I'm not saying it's the spark, but it was one of the sparks that led to the situation there. And so as the pie goes smaller and smaller, right, we'll see more desperation for people. Either some will walk, but some will choose to fight. And that's really the issue. Mm, yeah. Um, but it, uh, Nabi, this has been a superb conversation. We're, I'm just going to try and get a few more questions in here. Fran Hoffman, if we can get Fran in very quickly. Um, always very confused about the uh, dispute between the ISIS and Taliban in Afghanistan. Could you talk about both its geopolitical implications, but more significantly, your sense of its consequences going forward? Sure, great question. So, okay, so, the, so ISIS, uh, so, so let's say the, the, the Islamic State Khorasan province, right? So what does this mean, right? Essentially, ISIS, uh, you know, it would refer to different franchises that it had under its wing as provinces. So there was Islamic State, uh, you know, Iraq, uh, right? There was Islamic State, uh, you know, Ashan, which is the name for Syria. Um, you know, there was Islamic State in, in Khorasan, which is, which is the name for Afghanistan, right? This was basically a bunch of disgruntled Taliban people, right? So, so, so it was like a bunch of disgruntled guys from the Taliban in Afghanistan and also the Pakistani Taliban. And they came together and they pledged allegiance at the time to the Islamic State, which was happening you know, in parts of Iraq and Syria. The reason why is because at the time, really, it's worth remembering that ISIS was like the rock star of the jihadi world. I mean, they had achieved what no one else had, right? In the sense that they had managed to take over all this territory. They had sort of broken down these borders between Iraq and Syria. Uh, it was, I mean, I mean, it really was something in the jihadi world at the time, right? They were seen as a very effective force. And so, you know, I mean, contrast that with the stalemate situation, you know, for the Taliban, both in Afghanistan and in Pakistan. So you had disgruntled people from those groups coming together and forming uh, this of this Khorasan. And it's worth noting that because of the enmity with the Taliban, I mean, I mean, they were encroaching on the areas of each other, right? So this, so this group of renegade Taliban, if you will, Right, when they pledged allegiance to the Islamic State, right, and they basically kicked out Taliban from villages and they took over areas, right, that led to a real clash between the Taliban and ISIS K. And so, I mean, long term implications are this. In the past, when the Americans were present, they actually were helping the Taliban against ISIS K, right? I mean, I mean, there, it wasn't an official contact, but basically the Americans were acting as sort of the unofficial air force of the Taliban. So they would hit, hit ISIS K targets when the Taliban were attacked. Right. 
now this is, I think this will continue in some way, this unofficial cooperation, right? And it's not cooperation, it's not that they talk to the Taliban, they would see them fighting when they're moderating and they would sort of help them out in some way, right? I think this will continue. But the bigger problem is this, you know, essentially, you know, before Kabul was, well, well Kabul and major government controlled areas were unsafe because of the threat of bombings, right? Whether it's from ISIS-K or the Taliban. The Taliban have always been saying that they can provide security. Right, that's been their main thing. That okay, you know, like like we will come now, and and now the war is over, and you are safe and secure. Maybe the war is over, or largely over, but ISIS K is still there. And the fact is, it is not too difficult to bring one person in there to do these operations. And we saw that at the airport. And yes, it's worth noting the airport was a total crap show, a situation where there was there was just way too many people and too little security. And I saw that in the beginning. And I must say, like when I heard the warning, I actually didn't approach the airport because I was worried. Um, but my point is, is that it's very, very hard to secure a place like Kabul. It's been tried in, in, in Baghdad, right? They really tried to do it, and you can succeed, up, you know, you know, to a degree, but it's very onerous. And long term, I don't see how they'll do it. I have to say, right? I, I think you'll always have the threat of bombs. I think they'll do a better job than the government in fighting ISIS-K, but I don't think they'll, they'll completely remove it. Okay, Nabi, um, there we have to wrap it up for our, for our hour. I've been really, I've really, really enjoyed it. It's been a, a, a really informative conversation. So thank you very much indeed for now.